Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we had some technical difficulties here, and I hope you are hearing me um, and see me very well now. Uh, so if you can hear, hear me and see me all in all, can you just sing that to me that you are seeing me and you are hearing me? I just try to get the video on. Uh, you two uh, have some issues again with us as usual. Uh, all right, I see someone put their hand up to see they are hearing me, and I believe they are seeing me. Thank you. I'm so sorry for the delayed technical difficulties, but we want to welcome you again uh, to our uh, second day of our class. Uh, and we are on uh, what I call DIP uh, 101, uh, and that's the diplomat diplomatic uh, training for uh, those of us who intend to be members of the future diplomats and then be able to get your 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 uh, credentials with us as an as an ambassador one of our ambassadors and i'm and i'm so excited that many of you are taking your classes very seriously uh, many of you i uh, already started to submit your assignments uh, let me just make sure and talk about the assignments I have started to grade your papers, uh, and I will be sending some of your assignments uh, back to you uh, sometimes uh, between today and tomorrow. Uh, most of you have started grade, grading your assignments, uh, but you need to take in consideration that this is an institution, it is a school. Uh, please be mindful of your assignments. Uh, some of you are just uh, copying from the internet. Uh, that's 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 precarism, that's stealing, stealing information and not giving credit to uh, to the owner of that uh, of that paper that you're submitting. Uh, we uh, have discovered where some of your information came from on the internet and we're sending your paper back to you for some of you to rewrite your paper and we're gonna forgive you at this time. If you do that again, uh, you'll be dropped off the course because you cannot or just gather information from the internet and claim that they are your own information without giving uh, the credit to the original uh, uh, producer of that of that uh, of that material that you are using uh, currently. Uh, so please be mindful when you submit your assignments. Two, another thing about the assignments that we've been talking about, you have to you have to watch your or your, your grammar and your spelling, do a spelling check, all right? Uh, some of you are writing off sentences. Uh, some of you, some of your, some of your information has been checked. Uh, the, uh, the sentences are off, spelling uh, is, and you are repeating something, spelling the same thing over and over and again in the in in the in the uh, a wrong manner tells us that you uh you don't know how to spell that word <laughs> so do a spell it check uh make sure that you are doing what you need to do it is a serious thing because you have to pass this course to get your credentials you have to pass you to be recognized as an ambassador with us and so we encourage you uh to make sure that you are doing it uh I'm still looking up to see if we have other announcements here before we can run into into our presentation on what we stopped yesterday. Uh, Want to see yesterday? I'm talking about on Monday. Again, welcome to 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 second day of class. It is July 13, 2023, and we are talking about and this is course is what we call introduction to diplomacy. Uh, introduction to diplomacy. Uh, it is a required course now to become an uh, an ambassador with us uh, and to be able to get uh, the credentials uh, that you need to be effective and to be efficient. Uh, do we have any question that you've been tapping? Remember to tap in your questions as usual. Uh, and then uh, I got two persons, Ambassador David. Ambassador David and uh, Ambassador David. I don't know why John Mark always called me while in the middle of my teaching. I really don't know. I'm sorry, this is recorded. I'm calling his name. I don't know why he always called me while in the middle of my teaching. Uh, if you hear me, just put up your hand. If you see me, just put up your hand. I don't know what. Uh, 
uh, John Mark is calling me because he's not seeing me or he's not hearing me. If you see me again, just one, it can just be one person. If you can watch my video, you see me uh, and you are hearing me as I talk. Can you please just raise up your hand? Okay, great. Great. You see me, hear me. I don't know why people. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So we're talking about deeper mass. Uh, we, we want to, I'll be putting a couple of slides up here and uh, our show is going to be interfering. And I hope you stay, you stay, you stay be hearing me and be, and be seeing me. Uh, so we, we want to review, quickly review on what we, what we talk about, what we stopped last week, uh, sorry, on Monday. Uh, and we, we, I remember us talking about uh, deeper mouse. We defined deeper mouse. So our goal in last week was to talk about defining deeper mouse and what deeper mouse is all about. We realized that the author gave two key definitions of of of, of deeper mouse, and we look at that. I hope you are reading your book. Uh, this section is not to go through all through all the books and and everything else is just for us to uh, be able to talk to you about, about the most. But we step, uh, on, we're still on one-on-one uh, on Monday. And uh, we said, according to our notes, uh, there are four things involved. Someone, someone asked about the four elements. And that's what we'll be talking about again going today. There are four elements that are involved in making an attempt uh, to define it. Uh, deeper master. We said uh, on Monday, we stay in chapter one of your book. Uh, we said uh, uh, the first thing you need to classify. So cl cl classifying deeper master as a form of human relations. We said that deeper master has to do with what we call human relations. You are dealing with people. It is. It is, it is important that we need to understand that. We say we need to uh, specify the entities between the relationship uh, and who are involved. Uh, specify the relationship, those elements. Remember these elements. Uh, deeper mass involve really human, relation, human relations, and those relationships need to be specified. Uh, we need to identify the people who are in this relationship when we come to when we talk about diplomacy uh, and you will come to understand there are various types of diplomacy and there are key players in 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 the process and we will also you will also come to understand that uh we we need to suggest how the relationships are to be undertaken successfully again we are using the book uh Diplomacy in the 21st century. I hope most of you have gotten your book and your study and your uh, study guide. All right. So we said the first thing last Monday, someone asked me again. So I want to clarify. We talk about uh, classifying, specifying, identifying, and suggesting. Those are three key words you need to remember when it comes to diplomacy. Uh, the writer in 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 our course, uh, Paul Shack in uh, diplomacy, in the uh, chapter, in chapter one of, in chapter one of our of our course, the writer said that diplomacy is the art. Listen to this definition; it's important. And the writer said that diplomacy is an art in the science of maintaining peaceful relationships between nations, groups, individuals. Again, the author said in our book that uh, diplomacy is the art. In our study notes, if you go to your study notes, uh, when I see the author uh, of your study note now is me. The author of the textbook is 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 uh Paul Shack, the author of your study guide is me, Ernest Gibson. So I said in your study guide that diplomacy is the art and the science of maintaining peaceful relationships between nations, groups, and individuals. And we need to understand that it is important, for, excuse me, it's important for us to understand that diplomacy is involving 
you know, uh, maintaining peace. And that's the, that's the mindset of people in those days when we talk about diplomacy. Uh, but I said, in oftentimes, if you look at your study guide, I said, in oftentimes, diplomacy refers to representatives of different groups. And they'll be meeting to discuss five important things. If you remember that, I said, we'll be meeting to discuss conflict, trade, environment, technology, and security. Five things remember that, that diplomacy can be used to, dis to, to discuss conflict, trade, the environment, technology, and security. And if I give you an assignment, part of, in part of te technology, what we talk about the, uh, the AI, artificial intelligence, I say you need to define uh, artificial intelligence uh, and tell us why it is and how that relates to uh, to diplomacy. I said last week, or oh, sorry, on Monday, that the people who practice diplomacy are called diplomats. People who practice diplomacy are called diplomats. Let me give you an example. People think that diplomacy can just be uh, those who work with United Nations or those who are uh, those who are in government. Uh, now, when we talk about trade, if are you a business person to you sell your market? Look at the lady who sells her fish in the market. And she's a diplomat. See, dip, you, you know, uh, one of the things in diplomacy is is to, is to negotiate. You know, it simply means, uh, you know, when you try to negotiate, you tell the person, you give me this and I will give you that. Let's make an exchange, man. Let's have an agreement, right? So look at the lady who's selling her market. Is she a diplomat? Oh, yes, she is a diplomat because she's trading. She's in the trade. I said five things involved in diplomacy. You are not discussing comfort. You're discussing trade. You're discussing the environment. You're discussing technology or you are discussing security. So look at you selling your business. You're in the market. Right? Somebody comes, you, you tell them, uh, uh, I'm selling this fish, uh, a bus of, the, the bus of fish for maybe $10. Right? And the person tries to trade with you. Oh, uh, I get $8.50 or I got $9. Oh, no, it's $10. And you try to back in. Both for you are in in, in a diplomatic exchangement, you know, you are back and you're trying to negotiate. And those things are part of the responsibilities and the requirement of becoming an effective diplomat. You are trading. Uh, how about the person who's talking about environment? Oh, yes. And if, I, if you look at it, the uh, 17 uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations to talk about the environment. You know, uh, uh, we look at technology. So those are things. And those of us who practice these things, we're referred to as diplomats. You don't have to be working with the United Nations. You don't have to be in government to be referred as a diplomat. You can be a diplomat just as you are a business person. And so let's see diplomacy from that end. Uh, but you also need to understand that a group of diplomats who are representing one country and they are living in another country, they are on a diplomatic mission. Okay, so if you, if the future diplomats have you to go to represent us in another country and you take an assignment with another country, you are on a diplomatic mission. So people who leave one country, hear this very well, people who leave one country on an assignment and go to another country, they are on a diplomatic mission. All right. Uh, you come to even understand that uh, even students, even students, where if you go, if you read your uh, your textbook, you come to almost even students when you uh, they got people to people diplomacy, and so when a student travel that bro, are they on a, are they on a diplomatic mission? Oh yes, they are going to school. They are students, but they're doing deep. They we call it people to people diplomacy. Look at big girls and these other things we want to talk about in the course moving forward. So people who are on an assignment, uh, they are on a diplomatic mission. I hope you can remember that. Uh, a permanent, in your standard guard, you are said that a permanent diplomatic mission is called an embassy. A permanent diplomatic mission is called an embassy. So remember, remember diplomatic mission 
and the embassy. So a permanent diplomatic mission is called an embassy. The person who is the key diplomat at the embassy is what we call or who we call ambassador. So the person who is a key at the embassy or who is a leading diplomat official at the embassy is the people that we call ambassadors. So like we said, the future diplomats are going to open embassies around the world. Oh yes, the future Dubai embassies, and that will be our offices. And those of you who are going to be working at those offices, we're going to be referring to you as ambassadors. And that's why we're recruiting ambassadors around the world to represent us. So listen to this, an, an ambassador is the leading diplomat at an embassy. All right? Uh, a large diplomatic mission may be having, may have a representation uh, besides the embassy. So the single embassy, if they, let me go over again, let me go back again so you can understand this. A large diplomatic mission may have representation besides a single embassy. So if you if your country having other places to represent them in the same country, it is not called the embassy, it's called consulates. So it's C-O-N-S-U-L-A-T-E-S, consulates. Again, the large embassy, for instance, let me give an example, uh, example of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom have the, the, the embassy in Washington, D.C., in the United States of America. So the United Kingdom embassy is in Washington, D.C. But for the, United, for the United Kingdom to do effective and efficient work in the United States, then you have other places where the citizens can go. Now, those places are not referred to as embassies in the same country. They refer to as the consulates. So consulates is spelled C-O-N-S-U-L-A-T-E-S, -E consulate. So you don't have a lot of embassies in the country. You have one embassy, but you have other branches or other places to serve, and we call that consulates. So for instance, if the future diplomat has an, an embassy in, 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 in which country should you give example? Okay, for example, Nigeria in in uh, in Abuja, the capital in Abuja. If the future diplomat has an embassy in, in 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 Abuja, all the other branches in the local government sector is going to be referred to as our local consulates, where we have people going to take to get services. So remember, uh, I hear people say, well, we have, we got a lot of embassies in, in, in our country. For instance, the American, the American, you know, government has three embassies in, in three embassies in, uh, in, in Nigeria. Let me give us again. I don't know. They have one embassy in the capital of Abu, what is Abuja, and all the other offices around the country where they do their businesses is called consulate. So you need to understand if you are seeking the visa, you need to understand whether you go to the main embassy or you have to go to the consulate section to get a visa. Many countries, uh, from the U.S. standpoint, but yes, visas can be given to a consulate from a, from a consulate standpoint, but most of the visas can be issued from the embassy. All right. So remember that uh, between the embassy and that. Uh, and that. So like, again, like uh, the United Kingdom. So United Kingdom having um, offices, uh, what we call consulates, 
for instance, in the city of Atlanta, Boston, Massachusetts, Chicago, Illinois, Denver, Colorado, Texas, Los Angeles, uh, here in California as well, Miami, Florida, New York City, uh, Orlando, uh, uh, San Francisco, and all those all these places is the United Kingdom has in the United States they have what they call consulates, but the but the embassy is in Washington D.C. So you need to distinguish between consulates and 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 and, and embassies. Okay, uh, do we have any question? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, Ambassador. I'm uh, I'm a mercy. Yes, a permanent dip diplomatic mission is called an embassy. Perfect. That's correct. That's correct. Consulates are uh, diplomatic representation or branches of an embassy. That's correct in different areas. So in your country, you don't have three or four embassies. You have consulates, right? You have one embassy. Remember that as you become as you becoming a diplomat, you need to understand all these things because people gonna people gonna uh, to to hear how you speak. Oh, you know, we get count. We got diplomats uh, who work into full embassies in our country. You don't have full embassies in your country. You have one embassy, but you have you have one embassy, but you have consulates. All right, thank you, someone said. I can hear him very clearly. Okay, thank you so much. I'm glad that you hear me. Now, let's look at the American diplomats. Most of our things will come from our American standpoint uh, because we're dealing with uh, uh, our our uh, our central office is from our headquarters is in the United States of America. So in America, American diplomats work with the Department of State that is called Foreign Services. Remember this one: that uh, the American diplomats they work with the Department of State, and that department that they work with. In, our, in, in the United States here, we call that Department Foreign Services. And we have more than 12,000 people who work for the Foreign Services. And they, what they do is that they help Americans who travel abroad and, 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 and those who want to, uh, and they, they also pursue the interests of America. So the foreign services help us. For instance, if I traveled abroad uh, to any country around the world as an American citizen, uh, I have to identify myself with the foreign services. And when I get to any country in around the world, I first of all have to identify with the American embassy. I need to go to the American embassy. I need to uh, show my, uh, introduce myself to them as an American visiting that country. Uh, I go to the embassy. Normally, I don't go to the consulate, uh, to the consulate section. I go to the embassy itself, and the embassy itself we 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 connect with the with the foreign. Uh, 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 services in that local environment. That is the council to let them know that an American citizen is here, uh, he's in Kenya, uh, and uh, he's going to be at this location, uh, he's going to be there. And so, so anything that is happening in that country at that point in time, when the American government is looking for the citizens, they know where Ernest Gibson is. They know where I am located. They know where I live in that country. They know what I'm doing to that country. They can easily pick me up through the foreign services to bring me back to the United States of America. Uh, and, and, and so our diplomats, we work with what we call the foreign services. And again, we have 12,000 more than 12,000, more than 12,000 people who work for the for the United States government with these foreign services. That's a huge number. 4,000 people, diplomats from the United States of America around the world, 4,000. So understand that. Now, the United States having about 265 diplomatic missions around the world. Why? Because the United States want, the United States wants to do large and big businesses around the world they want to they want to protect the citizens they want to make sure the citizens in those countries are well taken care of and well protected in, in time in time of trouble to want to provide services to their citizens and at the same time they want to 
have interest, they want to uh, uh, have interest in the citizens of that country as well. They want to make sure that the, the world is getting to, the world is a better place. They're trying to protect their interests. In other words, the American government trying to protect their interests. So they have about 265 diplomat, diplomats, or, or not diplomats, but diplomatic missions around the world. And the largest diplomatic mission of the United Nations is in Mexico. Right, it's funny. The largest, the largest diplomatic mission of the United States is in Mexico, and Mexico alone has about 22 consulates and consular agencies. Now, hear me well. I never say embassy. In Mexico alone, there are 22 consulates and and consular agencies throughout the country. Just one country. Can you imagine? How the American government uh, is protecting their interests and the interests of the citizens and and the interests of uh, uh, the, the relationship with Mexico that they can be having 22 consulates around that, right? Uh, it may be different in countries, but let's look at, at the appointment of a diplomat. Uh, do we have any question? Uh, someone said my network is not too good. Well, <laughs> please find a way to do that. Uh, uh, someone said jo Ambassador Joseph said that lecture is unique. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, no question yet. Okay, we're gonna continue. Ambassador Amma is there. Uh, Mercy, Amma Mercy is there, so she will be able to send your questions over to us. Uh, yes, yes, yes. The largest consulate of the U.S. is in Mexico. That's correct. That's a good. Uh, people are people are coming. The largest diplomatic mission of the of the United States is in Mexico with 22 consulates. That's correct. Remember that. So remember that. And that's a one, that's why, and that's the same thing. That's the same thing we're trying to eliminate. Uh, we're trying to be like uh, having large diplomatic, you know, presence, the future diplomat around the world. Now, uh, the United States of America having diplomatic missions or, or ambassadors. Let me use the word ambassadors now. The United States having diplomatic missions and ambassadors in most countries, but not in all country. And it's surprising for us to come to understand that the United States of America have ambassadors in almost every country around the world, but not in all country. I give you an example in Cuba. The United States of America does not have an an, emba uh, uh, an embassy in Cuba. Cuba is spelled C U B A. Cuba. I want you to make a research to tell me why the United Nations does. I mean, sorry, not United Nations. The U S. <laughs> the United States of America does not have an embassy in Cuba. Make, make a research and tell me in your own understanding why the, why, sorry, someone's coming back to my phone. Why the United Nations, why the U, U.S. skips the United Nations? Let me, let me, let me go over it again. The United States of America has ambassadors in every country. Uh, Almost every country, but not all. Right? Uh, so the, the United Nations does not have a diplomatic mission president in Cuba. So your assignment will be why the US does not have an embassy in Cuba. Make a research. So your assignment now is make a research on your own country. Let's forget about Cuba and America. Make a research on your own country. And tell us if your embassy or if your country has embassy in every country of the world. 
And if your country does not have an embassy in a country, tell us why. So assignment is to make a research on your country to find out if it, if it does not have an embassy in a foreign country and tell us why. Right, don't forget about that assignment. I think uh, questions are coming up right now. All right, someone asks, why does America have 22 counselors in Mexico, in Mexico alone? That's a good question. I said in my notes because um, Mexico is huge and there are a lot of things. Remember that Mexico shares border with the United States. Uh, and a lot of people are coming in from in Mexico to the United States. So there are a lot of diplomatic work that has been done between the United States and Mexico. Uh, Mexico share border with, I don't know about your country, think about your country that next to you, right? Mexico shares border with the United States. In fact, when I sit in California, uh, we, we share border with Mexico. Right, we share border with Mexico, and so for the interest of America and the protection of America, because Mexico is so huge and large, and millions of people are coming, millions of people I'm talking about, millions of people are coming in from Mexico to the United States of America. They have a lot of counselors to be able to process, to be able to protect, and to be able to guard the interests of the United States of America. Uh, that's that's one of the reasons, and for all the political reasons that I mean, I know of for all of uh secret seven reasons that we may not, we cannot discuss online uh, right now. Uh, America has interest in, has, in the country and also interest in, in the United States, I mean, in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, sorry, in Mexico. So I hope that answers your question. I help you to give you an understanding. Another person said, the Officer in charge of a counselor is called what? Now, that's what you're going to learn about uh, attache, attache the feds. You, you, you have ambassadors who are assigned, but they are, cons they, are, they, are, they are counselors. They are counselors that are in charge of consulates. Uh, and then they have Attache, we're going to talk about Attache. We're going, to, we're going to give, in fact, we're going to give the different, good question, keep your question. We're going to give the different ranking positions of, of, of the of ambassadors and the different offices uh, that they occupy. Uh, the different offices that they occupy. Again, read your book, please. I'm just going through. I'm just I'm just reviewing everything that you need to review, but I'm going through your book. Um, now remember that uh, uh, I want to, I want to tell us this that uh, in 1961, I know some of, some of us are not born, so it's, it's time to be long. In 1961, uh, the U.S. withdrew diplomat, uh, diplomatic recognition from Cuba. In 1961, that had been a long time. The United Nations, the United States of America, withdrew diplomatic recognition from Cuba. Now, somebody need to ask why. Uh, some are, some are going to ask me why, and that's a good reason. But I'm going to make you to make a research. It's in my notes. Uh, it's in your book. So if you read your book, uh, you're going to know why. Uh, it's really about why they, uh, the, the United States of America would, withdrew diplomatic recognition from Cuba. But my greatest concern right now is what is a diplomatic recognition? Can anybody help us to answer what is a diplomatic recognition? Class, in, in 1961, the United States withdrew diplomatic recognition from Cuba. So my question is, what is a diplomatic recognition? It's in your book if you have read your book. Uh,
Yes, that person is it's right your book. Uh, Ambassador Gift said during President Carter's administration in 1977, the United States and Cuba signed, it's in your book, signed an agreement to establish the U.S. interest section. Yes, it's called, it's called U U.S. intent or you sent U.S.I.N.T. Right? That's, uh, uh, that's not an embassy. So, so they sign a contract. So they say they sign an embassy. So they don't have an embassy. In fact, in fact, uh, I give it to you in your study notes. If you can check your study note, uh, the uh, the the Cuban government also have their interest in the United States. And let me go ahead with that question. I mean that that comment is a good contribution because I'm going to talk about that. Cuba and the United States sign this interest, common interest. Like I say, America has interest in every country around the world. And that's why they're having hundreds of, uh, 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 hundreds of diplomatic missions around the world. Uh, but in the United States, Cuba does not, does not have an embassy as well. So Cuba is, the embassy here is, is uh, in, in America, sorry, in Washington, D.C., uh, Cuba is represented by the Swiss Embassy. It's Swiss, S-W-I-S-S, -S, Swiss Embassy. So the Swiss Embassy is representing the Cuban government in Washington, D.C. So Cuba does not have an embassy. And the same way in Cuba, the United States is represented there in the same way in Switzerland. Right, so they have they have another branch there. So the the, the, the sign a, a, a part or an agreement, but they don't have embassies in these countries. They are represented by Swiss by the Swiss embassy. Uh, so so it's called in the, in America. It's called you sent Havana H A V A N A. If you, if you check that, it's going to be your note. It's called the Houston Havana H A V A N A. Uh, okay, somebody asked the question: What's the diplomatic recognition? So someone tested. Tom Justin said, "Diplomatic mission is the international law is unlimited political aid or state uh, and knowledge. Oh, uh, uh, yes, and knowledge is." An act or status of another state or government. That's correct. That's correct. So simple put it, uh, diplomatic, you correct. A diplomatic recognition is the act of one nation or one state accepting the independence and the legacy of another state or another country. Make it simple like that. I know you want to speak, you know, you, you want to go a lot of good things here. But diplomatic recognition is just simple. A country, and every time he was talking about a state, and our lecture we talking about a country. So a diplomatic recognition is the act, and the act means the law. It's an act of one nation or state accepting the independence and legacy of another nation or another state. Two words: the independence. And a legitimacy of under so so the United States of America recognized uh eighteen it was in eighteen forty eighteen forty seven uh between eighteen forty seven to eighteen forty nine between eighteen forty seven eighteen fifty run about run up run run about that. The United Nations recognized the independence. Let me give an example for the Republic of Liberia. So the, it, it was called a diplomatic recognition. And when a country has a diplomatic recognition, then they come into an agreement. That's when the country will now recognize and send an, an ambassador for the initial stage to set up their embassy in that country. So a diplomatic recognition is an act of one country, one nation, 
recognizing another state or another country, right? So you being you being you being our our diplomats going around the world, well, we recognize those countries, and that's why we send we send you there. So today, the United States is represented by a branch of the Swiss Embassy in Cuba, right? And I said that. So uh, the United States is represented by but a branch of the Swiss Embassy in Cuba. We don't have we don't have one there. Now we want to know how uh, our embassies are staffed. So it may be different from different countries. It may be different from different countries. But from the American perspective, American diplomatic missions are staffed by foreign service officials. Take note of this one, that American diplomatic missions are staffed by what we call the foreign service officials. It may be different from your country, right? And since I don't know about your country, that's why most of the time yeah, you hear me talking about the United States of America, because I understand a diplomatic move from the United States of America than your country. So you, 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 you just need to study it and see, and see who staff your, through your diplomatic missions abroad. But from the United States, uh, our diplomats are sent by what we call the foreign service of service foreign service officials and foreign service specialists. Now there are two things: they are officials and they are specialists. All right. Uh, there are five major branches of the work of the foreign services when it comes to the United States of America. That's correct. A diplomatic mission, we'll finish with it, but I'm guess a diplomatic mission is the is the highest of is the is the heart of one nation or state accepting the independence and legacy of another towards the independence and legacy of the state. That's correct. Uh so I'll say yay. Havana, Cuba. <laughs> yes, Havana, Cuba. That's Elizabeth. Thank you that you follow me and I really appreciate that. But um there are five major branches of the work of the foreign services officials. I don't know about your country, but, but officials from the United States that we call diplomats. One is what we call, take notes of these five. One is what we call consular affairs. C-O-N-S-U-L-A-R, consular affairs. The consular affairs help Americans to live or to visit foreign countries. It's called a consular affairs. Uh, they help Americans. The consular affairs help Americans to visit and to live into foreign, foreign countries. For instance, if I want to take, if I want to travel to any country around the world, I check with, I check with the foreign affairs. I check with us, uh, with them, and I want to know what's What's the update of that country when it comes to security? When it comes to business, if I want to do business in that country, I I, I connect with the with the consular affairs, and they will tell me, you know, it's good to do business in Kenya for now, or it's not good to do business in Kenya uh, for now because of a uh, lot of bravery. You got to go through this, for example, uh, you know, and so the so the foreign affairs help. The U.S. citizens to travel abroad, to live abroad, and to do, you know, and to do their businesses around. They will have the economic affairs. The economic affairs. Economic affairs also make sure they're helping the American citizens to live abroad. At the same time, they are protecting the interest of the American government financially. They use the financial weight and financial weight power uh, to other countries. So we have the economic affairs. We also have the management affairs. We have we also have the political affairs. Political affairs are involving in politics in the states of other countries. And then we have the pop the, the public diplomacy. I'm gonna talk about public diplomacy among every one of them for, for many reasons. Um but the five branches again 
of our foreign services officials are the counselor affairs, economic affairs, management affairs, political affairs, and public diplomacy. Hear that again? The counselor affairs is the first out of the five major branches of our foreign services of features. We have the economic affairs, we have management affairs, we have political affairs, and we have public diplomacy. Make research of your country. See how many branches that your foreign services have when we're sending people on diplomatic missions around the world. Uh, you don't have to submit that in to me as an assignment, but it gives you an idea that when you, you as, as an ambassador, uh, as an ambassador with the future diplomats and you're trying to do business with your country or with other countries around the world, you come to have an understanding which affairs or which department you have to do your business with. You cannot go and do uh, council affairs with the management affairs. You cannot go and do the public diplomacy with the council affairs. Every branch of your foreign services are there for a particular reason. I'm going to say this again. Every branch of the foreign services of your country, they are there for a particular reason. So my my greatest goal and desire is that check with your foreign affairs or check with your diplomatic agency to know what the branches are and if future diplomat is to do business with them, which branch, which part of the, which part of your government, which part of the embassy that we can do business with. Uh, and because many diplomats do not understand, they will try to do business with all with embassies around the world, they were sending proposals, they were sending letters. Sometimes it will not be honored, or they will give you a referral because they will tell you, "We don't, we don't do that here. Or uh, this is not part of our, you know, uh, uh, this is not part of our responsibilities. Uh, it's not part of our rule. It's outside of our jurisdiction." You know, most times we say it's outside of our jurisdiction or it's, it's, it's outside of our of our responsibility. And sometimes they will make a referral, right? But as I'm going to be talking about public diplomacy, uh, who can tell me, class, what is public diplomacy? Or give me a practical example of, 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 of public diplomacy. I want someone just to give me, do not define public diplomacy, but give me a practical example of public diplomacy. I'm gonna wait for I'm gonna wait for a second, two seconds. Give me an example of public diplomacy. An example of the practice of public diplomacy. Anybody? Okay, let me go ahead. Uh, let me give an example that I'm going to be talking about. Let me give an example. Since I've been waiting for someone to give me an example of public an example of the practice of public. Now, let me say this. Let me give the practical example for you to see. Remember this one. It can be, or how many of you know that the World Cup, the World Cup is an example of practicing public diplomacy. African Cups of Nations is an example of the practice of public diplomacy. Now, just surprise some of you, right? Oh, yes. Diplomatic is displayed in every area of our, of our lives. Diplomatic is displayed in every area of our lives. So the, so the, the African couple nation is an example of, of, of public diplomacy. Why? Public diplomacy, let me give an example, it, 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 it's, it's, it's through social and cultural activities. 
again, public diplomacy is displayed through social and cultural activities. Social, S-O-C-I-A-L, and cultural, C-U-L-T-U-R-A-L, cultural activities. So any sports event can be referred to as public diplomacy. Radio broadcast can be referred to as a public diplomacy. This our broadcast, our training on YouTube, it can be referred to as a public diplomacy. So we need to understand that public diplomacy, someone said, Olympic game is an example of public diplomacy. That's correct. That's what I'm saying. That's correct. Another person said, public diplomacy is promoting culture of a country. That's correct. Now, remember, I said at our conferences, on the last day, we have what we call cultural performances. The cultural performances on the last day of the of the of the cultural uh, presentation at our conference, the future deeper conferences, is a public diplomacy. You are portraying your culture in a diplomatic way. <laughs> so diplomatic, my friend, uh, 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 activities are spread to all. That's why. When, let's go back to the sports Olympic. That's why when people go on the sports field, maybe on the soccer page during World Cup, and they misbehave, the referee gave them other yellow card to warn them or red card to vacate. And they will not just leave the fee, but they will leave. I mean, not just what they are playing, but they leave even at the at the at the bar stand. They don't even stay on the pitch. They go back in the locker room. They have, they have wrongly represented the team or the country. And that's why anybody who comes on our platform and pro proclaim to be, because our platform is a platform for public diplomacy, my friend. That's one of the reasons why we said now you must go through this training. Because our platform is the platform for public diplomacy. And if you came on our platform and you misbehave, that's why we gave some people a yellow card as warning. Don't do this again. If you continue, if you do that the second time, we gave you a red card. We say, get off our platform. We take you off our platform. It's public diplomacy. So we need to understand that that diplomacy, my friend, it's not just where you coat and tie and suit and sit in an office or try to negotiate. Diplomacy is displayed in every level of our lives. Radio and television, oh yes, picture, internet, social media, they are all part of public diplomacy. So as a diplomat, what do you do when you get on social media? As an, as an ambassador with the future diplomats, what do you do when you get in our chat rooms and on our platform? You are displaying that you are qualified to become a diplomat with us or you are not. Our platform is a place for public diplomacy. You are practicing and living out who you think you are. Those who are producing films, for instance, I love watching, you know, African movies and Nigerian movies and, and you know, let me hear you, let me say this, films, those who are actors in the, in the, in the film production, they are engaging in public diplomacy. So how do you present yourself? How do you represent your country? What type of, what type of movies are we producing? It's representing not just us, but our countries. It's public diplomacy. Right? Oh, somebody just said, oh, I love this. Uh, someone just said, Ambassador Tyan just said, war, beauty, passion. That's correct. War, beauty, passion is a public diplomacy. Education and exchange program for, for scholars is a public diplomacy. 
But but hear me well. It can be a public diplomacy. It can also be people to people diplomacy, and we're going to talk about that. So there is a difference between public diplomacy and people to people diplomacy. For instance, when a student is going abroad to study, when I said before, it may not just be. It's not public diplomacy. It's people to people diplomacy, right? So I agree with your contribution, but we've got to be mindful of when it comes to the student going abroad for studies and things like that. Student exchange program, yes, you all depends on the exchange program, all depends on what if we if we if we get towards science or cultural or representation or activities, then we can say yes, yeah, it is the practice of public diplomacy. All right, but we have public diplomacy and people people to people diplomacy. It's all part of your notes. Now, let me talk about this one. Broadcasting can be said to be an example of public diplomacy. That's correct. That's correct. That's... So you see, folks, we're learning diplomacy now from a different standpoint. Many times we thought diplomacy could just be someone wearing coat, suit and tie and going around the world, you know, flying around the world or driving in the, in the nice Mercedes Benz and going to, to keep peace around the world. And then they say the person is a diplomat or the person is a representation in the government. He's a senator or it's a minister and he's a diplomat. No, diplomacy is broad. It can be spread in every area. People who are sports advocates or people who are in sports, they are in diplomacy. People who are producing films, movies, they are in public diplomacy. Teachers and students, like someone said, all depends. They are in public diploma diplomacy. Our chat room, the future diplomat chat room, is a place for public diplomacy. So what are you doing with your, with us, us in your public diplomacy? Uh, diplomacy perfection is important. And it's essentially important, folks, to understand that diplomacy is not just, again, wearing suit and tie. The person can be wearing T-shirts and can be on the soccer page. He's in public diplomacy, cultural and social activities. Again, cultural and social activities. If I involve into that, you are part of the diplomatic community. Now let's come back to our, our study notes in your study guard. Right? Foreign, the foreign services specialist, listen to this one, it's important. The foreign services specialists from the United States of America, they provide important services for our diplomatic missions around the world. Right? Uh, the foreign service specialists provide important support services for diplomatic missions as well. Now, remember this, that the foreign services can also, they're not just in, the diplomatic services will not just be negotiate, negotiating and bringing peace. They can also provide healthcare services, construction, engineering, English language programs. So hear me. They have a, we have what we call the foreign services officials and we have the foreign services specialist. The foreign services specialists of the United States of America provide important support to our diplomatic missions around the world. In the same way, like the foreign services uh, uh, I mean, I mean, our ambassador is going to provide important support to our diplomatic missions around the world. It includes healthcare, it includes construction, it includes engineering, English. I mean, uh, uh, in English language or foreign language programs. So, for us, the future diplomats, we thank God that we having. Uh, with us, Ambassador uh, Amma Mercy Samuel. Amma Mercy Samuel is very much influenced in French. In fact, she is a French professor. Amma Mercy Samuel is going to help us in our foreign services 
one of the courses we're going to do at the future diploma is to teach French, right? And we have two French professors that, that have come on board with us. And they will be having live interaction programs, making sure that some of our ambassadors who want to travel around the world, especially to the Francophone countries, must be able to speak a little bit of French. They can greet themselves. They can talk to people in French. They know how to call their name in French and, and, and so forth. And so, so that's why and it's important to understand that diplomatic missions, the specialists are not just there to keep peace. They are not just there to negotiate. They are also there to provide important services to diplomatic missions. Again, construction, engineering, language program, healthcare, those are the things that people need to be aware of. Okay. So, is, this, is there any question? Is there any question uh, for this one time presentation? Then I can move forward. Uh, if there's any question. I want you to take notes in chapter one. It's talk about different things. So please read your book. Uh, continue to read your book. Uh, and we are here to for you to ask your questions. So we are moving forward. I hope you can still see me and you can hear me. I'm still waiting for questions because I've gone one hour presentation. Or I, or I can move ahead so that we can conclude this thing. Now, beginning today and the end of this week, you should be in chapter two of your book. In chapter two, ask a simple question. Why we need diplomacy and diplomats. So the chapter in chapter two that you're going to read it this week, we examine why we need dip diplomacy and diplomats. Uh, the first thing in that chapter you're going to be looking at as what I call the historical and the, the historical anthropological and the social uh, stories about the origins or the beginning of diplomacy. The main thing we're going to be looking at will be the anthrop anthropology, anthropology and history. Excuse me. And most of us should know what uh, anthropology is. Right? Study of man. Study of human being. Right? And so they're going to study. Uh, in that, in that, uh, hold on one minute. In that chapter you're going to read this week, before I go to my study, I'm going to be focusing on the study notes, not the book. But in that, in that chapter where you're going to read, let me just uh, uh, make us to get a few things. Uh, in that chap in the chapter of chapter two, where you're going to read this week, uh, they, the the writer is uh, Paul Shack is going to be talking about looking at the terms of diplomacy, and he says that the term of diplomacy is a tricky one. He he trying to make us to understand that what may be referred to in chapter two of the textbook this week, or uh, why you refer to as diplomacy in one country or diplomacy in one country may not be diplomacy to another country. Uh, 
I gave you an example uh, to that. Um, he said, before I give you an example, he said in chapter two that the word uh, diplomats may describe something else to, you, to one person and it may describe something else to another person. For example, let me give an example. The Chinese, the Chinese, according to uh, Paul Shack in our book, in chapter two, you're going to read, uh, he, he tend to, to equip diplomacy to foreign policy. So the Chinese be believe when you talk about diplomacy, man, you might just be talking about foreign policy. Anything to the Chinese government is about foreign policy. All right, then they refer to that as diplomacy. For instance, the Americans, when the Americans talk about diplomacy, they are talking about international relations in general. Amen to that. Somebody want to say amen, I'll say amen to that, right? The American, the Americans often refer to foreign policy as international relations. So hear me well, the Chinese, Talk about policy when it, when it, foreign policy when it, when they're talking about uh, diplomacy. The Americans we talk about international relations in general when we're talking about diplomacy, and many other English speakers when they talk about diplomacy. They are talking about the way in which the people are communicating with other people, especially when it comes to difficult issues or issues that potentially that has the potential to create problems. Right? So you see different meaning to different people. Now, in chapter two, uh, the writer Paul Shark would tell you that anthropologists tell us that once people see themselves living in separate groups, when these groups come together to meet, they must find a way to communicate. And so the writer is trying to say in chapter two of the textbook that communication is an important key to diplomacy. Communication is an important key. And he went back to talk about anthropologists. And the anthropology, like I said, anthropologists are people who studied the life or the study of humans, right? Or we call it anthropology simply means the study of man. Anthro, human or man, Anthropology, study of. So anthropology simply means it's a study of human beings or the study of man. So uh, anthropologists believe that diplomacy, we're talking about the history of diplomacy now, goes way back to what we have today. Anthropologists believe that the history of diplomacy starts when men began to associate themselves together. And that's chapter two you're gonna be you're gonna be reading the rest of this week. I hope somebody I started reading chapter two already. For instance, anthropologist in an anthropologist is in your book, but it's spelled if you want to spell it, you spell A N T H R O P O L O G R S T S. Anthropologist. Anthropologist. Again, it's A N T H R O P O L O G I S T S. Anthropologist says that diplomacy goes way beyond what we think is happening today. They say, as long as people were gathering together, they must find a way to communicate. And communication requires a skill or a level of diplomacy. All right, anthropologists never said this, but those of you who are believe, 
Christians, uh, those of you who have your faith, uh, those of you who read in the good book, the Bible, what we say, Deeper Master went back way back in the Garden of Eden. When, 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 when God visited uh, or Adam toward the Garden of the Day to communicate with man. Or do we say Deeper Master happened uh, with, with maybe the Muslim religion when Muhammad said, felt that he, that he found a visit, uh, he had a visitation from God with an angel. So diplomacy involved interaction with people. So it goes beyond what our history gives us today. In fact, anthropologists uh, will not just believe that diplomacy started with the with, with India when, when the Indian government was sending a representation to another country with a letter. So yes, yes, history says diplomacy began by a letter, sending a communication. Before you have an ambassador those days, you must have something important to communicate. Hear me this again. Uh, for diplomacy in those days to be effective, before you have an ambassador, it means she has something important to communicate. And the importance of your communication representing out of your family, your country, the nation, becomes important. So someone will be selected. That's a historical view of ambassadors, though. Someone have to be selected or elected, appointed, to go and represent your group, your family, your community, or your country. And they are going with a letter on your behalf or on the behalf of the government. So it was a full representation. And history says, now we're talking about chapter two, history says that when the person is sent on a diplomatic mission as an ambassador just to communicate, when uh, the communication is done, the office is closed. They are not ambassador anymore because they were selected on a particular mission. And let me say this to you, that in the United States of America, ambassadors are not appointed by nobody else besides the president. Remember this one, that ambassadors in the United States of America are appointed by the president of the United States of America. I don't know who appoints your ambassador in your country, so make a research. Make a research. Don't submit it to us as an assignment, but just for your own enlightenment, uh, for the, the, the functionality of your civil, of your, of your foreign service or your international relations, whatever you term it, your, your foreign policy policy, your foreign policies <laughs> policy. Uh, to know who appoints your ambassadors. But ambassadors are appointed by the president of the United States of America, not by Congress, not by, no, they are appointed by the president. Yes, they go before Congress for confirmation. They go before Congress to be approved. But ambassadors are appointed by the president of the United States of America, not the vice president, not the speaker of the house, not anybody else, but the president of the United States of America. And that's why in the future diplomats will do the same. Your president or your, your DG appoints our ambassadors. We appoint you, I appoint you as ambassadors around the world representing our interest in your country. So, and that's why the writer is talking about in chapter two of your book. He said, I want people together uh, to do anything and communicate. They are involved in diplomacy. It's, cool. it's because they're communicating. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't snow here uh, in California where I am. In fact, one of the reasons why I moved to California because it's very, it's a nice world of beautiful weather, good weather. Uh, but when I was in Pennsylvania, that is uh, Pennsylvania, that is in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, there were heavy snow. 
It snowed during the time. Man, the snow will go to, to 6, 10, 12 inches. The snow will cover your entire vehicle. In fact, sometimes when the snow falls, your front door will not open. People will not, people will not even go to work, you know, for one or two days. What happens, hope you, hope you still see me. What happens, any question? Uh, Ambassadors are now appointed by the president of the United States. Yes, ambassadors now now. Ambassadors have always been appointed by the president of the United States of America. But I was talking about the snow. When it snows in the in Pennsylvania area, we will come outside to shovel your snow from your from in front of your house, in front of your door. Your neighbor will come outside. Other, you will come out. Other neighbors come. And sometimes the houses are you know, so close to each other. The neighbors will, sh will shovel the snow together. And they will start to communicate and talk and interacting. And then they will say, you know, let's do, my, let's do the part of my portion of my yard first. And then we'll do your yard second. The writer in chapter 2 says, that was a form of diplomacy in those days. You will see that in the book. That was a form of, it was, as long as people came together to do that, it was referred to as diplomacy in those days. So you even share with snow, you become an ambassador. <laughs> you represent your family. And then and you are negotiating and say, let's do this side. Do my, let's do my side, I will do your side. You are bargaining. You are sharing ideas. That was diplomacy according to the author. Now, according to anthropology, they cannot pin down when uh, diploma, diplomacy actually started. They cannot pin down. But the two, but one thing I want you to understand that both anthropology, anthropology, anthropologists and historians believe that uh, diplomacy uh, became more complex, more institutionalized, and eventually professionalized as diplomacy began to and you know, began to grow and it began to extend. They cannot pin down, again, anthropologists cannot pin down when diplomacy actually started. So what anthropologists are telling us, we cannot tell you when diplomacy actually started. But one thing we can make you to understand that diplomacy grew and became more complex, more institutionalized, and eventually, eventually became professionalized when a lot of people started to be involved in it, when a lot of players we call them actors started to get involved in diplomacy, right? And there will be a lot of examples when you start to read in chapter three of your textbook. You will begin to, uh, to give you messengers, right? Messengers. And, and, and so to formulate it, for instance, uh, in China, let me give an example in ancient time. In, in ancient China, let me give an example. Uh, what we call diplomacy in ancient time was, sup was supposed to be about uh, uh, how to call ordering of relationships between the empire who occupy a position of the center and and, and, and that person wants to communicate his message to the other empire or to people around the world. No, so what was what was what was to them as 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 diplomacy is different from us today. So uh, let me give a simple example as is, as as diplomacy began to get widespread. Uh, it began to be, to spread between groups, uh, between law enforcement officials, between gang members, whatever. But to simply put it, 
A diplomacy occurs whenever separated groups enter into relationship with another person or another group. Again, I'm going to say that diplomacy occurs according to the according to your author in chapter two. Uh, diplomacy occurs whenever separated groups or people come into relationship with one another. I said before, when the residents of an apartment or a building, when they came together to clear snow from the driveway, they, they were practicing, they, they were they were practicing the diplomacy that when they feel that according to the altar. So take this note. Uh, anthropology, according to your altar of your textbook, anthropology and historian are very good at tracking the way that diplomacy emerges uh, from one state to the next state. And they, they say that it's getting more complex. And this is why the author said that we need diplomats and diplomacy because things are getting more complex. Remember, we are on, on the subject today of why we need diplomacy and diplomats. Because diplomacy emerges in its simplest state and can evolve into something more complex. And this is fun all over the place. Look around us. See what is happening. See what is going on. Why we don't need diplomacy and we don't need diplomacy today? See the war going everywhere. Infliction of things. Our community is so bad off. People are suffering. Why we need ambassadors? Why do we need diplomacy? We need it because things are getting off hand. We need selected people. Again, remember, if we go back to historian or, or anthropologists, they believe that diplomats or, or ambassadors were selected people who were selected to communicate a strong message, to bring about a change or to negotiate in the favor or in the favor of the person who they are advocating for. Uh, in your textbook, you're going you're gonna to learn also what I call the diplomatic climate. I'm not going to talk about diplomatic climate right now. I'm just going to give you an, an, an overview of that, a diplomatic climate. Uh, but before we come to the diplomatic climate, I want you to understand. Uh, let me see if I have any, any question or oh, no question. Uh, then let me make sure that people are hearing me. Are you hearing me? Again, if you are hearing me, I don't want to be speaking to, for, by myself for too long. If you hear me, just one person pull up your hand. Why do we need, yes, why do we need diplomacy and diplomacy? Yes, I just said that. Oh, yes, we are, yeah, we can hear you, sir. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. You don't, everybody don't have to put up their hand, Ambassador. Uh, I'm at mercy so we can hear you. So why do we need why do we need diplomacy and diplomats? I said we need diplomats, diplomacy and diplomats because of the unfolding or the emerging of what is happening around the world. Right? We we have only a few selected people in those days to represent a group of people, a tribe or a nation. But right now, we need millions of people to represent because the world is falling apart. Things are getting off hand. We need diplomacy because diplomacy can, is, is the key to solving our world's problems. And remember, I said last week or on Monday, there are two types of diplomacy. We have what we call institutionalized diplomacy, and we have people-to-people -people diplomacy. What is institutionalized diplomacy? I said, it's solving problems. We call that pro uh, a problem-solving diplomacy. So, an example of problem-solving diplomacy can be the United Nations. 
United Nations came in existing because of World War II. That was a problem. And the world wanted to end World War II. So the problem of diplomacy. So United Nations came as an institution. So we call that diplomatic or sovereign, prop, sovereign problem diplomacy. United Nations is a sovereign problem diplomacy. The League of Nations, another example. The League of Nations is the solving problem diplomacy. Why? The League of Nations came information to end World War I. So the League of Nations ended World War I, but they could not succeed in any World War II. So the United Nations came as an institutionalized diplomacy to end World War II. <laughs> but now we need People to people diplomacy, and that's why, and that's where the future diplomat comes in. People to people diplomacy, where we can be able to not just look at institution, but we can look at people. Oh my, 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 my thought go way, my thought goes way back. We are solving world's problems. That's why we need ambassadors. That's how we need diplomats to solve war problems. People's problem, not institutional problem. You know, people want to grow big institution to make name for themselves. People want to establish diplomacy to say, well, this is me or this is what I'm doing. This is my institution. The future diplomat on our diplomacy engagement, we are not an institution. We are a movement that is moving across the globe, people to people and solving problems. So if you're looking for an organization, then we, the future diplomat, is not for you. If you're looking for people to people diplomacy and ambassadorial relationship, then the future diplomat is for you. So take this in mind. Diplomacy has emerged. Diplomacy has expanded because of the world's problem. So the time for building institutionalized diplomacy should cease. The time for people diplomacy is important. Let me give you an example of people to people diplomacy. Let's look at Bill Gates. Bill Gates and Mandela Gates, they are an example of people-to-people -people diplomacy. They are involving in changing lives. In fact, Bill Gates was the initiator, the organizer in the production of the very computer we sit on today. The war perfect program that we use in our computers. He was not just building an institution for himself. He was providing solution to the world. For the world to become a group of village, we have the computer, we have the system. So it, it, it's more than institutionalized diplomacy. It's now Becoming to be people to people diplomacy. So why do we need diplomacy? Because the world has extended. People were involved in self-interest. But today, the world has extended. The world has become a global village. We need more people to represent and to solve problems. More people to represent and to solve problems. Somebody said the network is bad. They left, uh, you figure out how you're gonna do that, folk. Um, so, uh, any question, no question yet? No question. All right, remember this, that anthropologists, let me check my time, okay, a couple of minutes. Anthropo anthropologists are not good at 
telling us why people live in groups. Anthropologists are people who said it, human beings, like I said. But one thing they are not good at, they are not good to tell us why people live in groups. Why the relationships between groups seem to be different from, from, from ones within themselves. Right? And when relationships between groups take a diplomatic character. I'm going to say this again. Anthropolog anthropologists and historians are not good. They are not so good in telling us why people live in groups. Why the relationships between groups seem to be different from the ones within them and why relationship or relations between groups take a, when it takes what we call a diplomatic uh, character, right? Uh, some people live with each other rather than alone. Why? Because, to, because each one of us need each other. Some people decide to live alone. Some people say we live to live in group. Society live in group. And if society will live in group, that means they, they need each other. And that's why we need diplomats and dip diplomats and diplomats because people are interacting. There may be someone who to stand between the groups. There may be someone to represent and advocate. There may be someone to make sure that everything is going right. All right. Any question? Uh, let me say this to us. In diplomacy, we need to understand that relationships within groups take place along several dimensions. Uh, several dimensions. I talked about this before. Let me give you an, let me give you some example. Take note of date, this. Please take note of this. Relationships within groups take place along several dimensions. I'm gonna I'm gonna name some of the dimensions to you. Let me give you an example. Legal dimension, economic dimension, political dimension, cultural dimension, and emotional dimension. I want to say this again. Relationships within groups take place along several dimensions. And I want to give you five of those dimensions. Legal dimensions, in other words, the things that happen at the legal level. So we need diplomats at the legal level. We need people who, that's what I'm, we're so glad that the diplomats, or the, the, our ambassadors, who are coming alongside of us, we have people who are legal advisors. We have lawyers amongst us because diplomacy is taking a different trend. A different, so we need lawyers to be with us, right? We, 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 uh, there's a legal dimension, economic dimension, financial things are falling apart. You know, the, in fact, the American government is involving in economic dimension to make sure that the, the UN currency is, is stable and, and, and still has value economic dimension, political dimension. The United States and your country and my country, we are protecting our interests politically around the world. Political dimension, cultural dimension. We talk about cultural dimension and, and we just talk about that. And, 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 and we, we, we talk about that in what we call the uh, uh, public diplomacy, cultural dimension, right? Every culture is trying to, to Project the culture around the world. Emotional dimensions. Some diplomats feel the emotional dimension. Some diplomats cannot control their emotions. So they have emotional dimension. And those of us who cannot control our emotion, it's hard for us to become effective and tact tactful. Hear the word again, tactful. Efficient 
and tactful. I gave you another assignment to define what it what tactful means and what it is to become a tactful ambassador. All right. So it is important for us to understand that. Uh, a relationship takes relationship in, in our diplomacy it takes a lot of different levels. Let me talk about culture. Let me let me give you the dimensions. Let me talk about this one. So we'll talk about uh, emotional bonds between groups. Emotional bonds are important. Cultural significance between groups are important. Now, if you are dealing with someone as an ambassador, what is your emotional bound or your emotional connection? Emotion just not to be able to, I mean, it's not just talking about controlling your emotions, but are you sympathetic as an ambassador? Do you have, do you have an emotion, an emotional bound between you and the person you're working with? Do you have an emotional bound of the person's problem? Look in your community as an ambassador. What type of bound do you have with your community? Your cultural, cultural significance. Cult, cultural signals between groups are very much important. It may be weak. It may be weak in some group. It may be strong in some group. But it is important in the historical context of diplomacy. Again, cultural signals are important. We need to understand the culture of the different groups. Someone asked a question, I'm going to get with that. Uh, but cultural, uh, cultural, cu cultural signals are important. Political relationships are also important. We need to understand what is the political relationship that we have as ambassadors with the group or people we interact with. As a result of a relationship politically, as ambassadors, uh, we, we gave us, <coughs> we show our strength or we show our weakness. What is our legal relationship between the groups as ambassadors? Those things are serious, <coughs> excuse me, things that we need to take in consideration. Now, take this, take this note. It's in your book. It's in, uh, it's in, uh, 2.3, 2.3, but take note of this one. When people handle relationships between groups on the basis of shared understanding, hear this word, shared understanding. When people handle relationships uh, uh, between groups on the basis of shared understanding or how they're going to do and going to work together, we can say that they are practicing diplomacy or they are doing diplomacy. So in other words, the, the author Paul Schack said, in other words, he said that diplomacy simply means that people have understood, have to, have to, have to, have to have a shared understanding and how these things will be conducted. So diplomacy by the author, in your book, in your study book, if you read in your study book, give six dimensions or what we call six challenges. Let me use the word challenges. Six challenges. The first challenge is presented by maintaining diplomatic security and safety. The first challenge that the authors gave in the six challenges that diplomat will face will be maintaining diplomatic security and safety. Remember these six challenges. Challenge number one, as an ambassador, what you're going to face is how I can maintain my diplomatic security and safety. All over the world, uh, diplomats, ambassadors, 
sometimes may be attacked either through physical, moral, or verbal attacks. So the writer is concerned in your chapter when you read about these problems and how groups can set princes, principle up so that they can be protected. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why many countries get what they call the letter of credence. The letter of credence simply means a document to give our diplomat a support to be protected. And I said that the future diplomats also want to give our respective diplomats a letter of credence so that they can be protected, introducing them to the embassies in the country, introducing them to the government of the country so that they can have that credence and support. Right? Uh, so that is so much important. The second rule, that is, diplomats was careful of the messengers in those days not to be killed, in other words. Oh, yes. Ambassadors and diplomats were killed around the world. So for diplomats to be protected, they, there was a challenge of how can we protect that. So the writer will explain to you that the first challenge is going to be how can, how can you maintain diplomatic security and safety? The second challenge is about presenting what we call the diplomatic communication and representation. One group has decided to communicate with each other. How would they do it effectively? How they will negotiate? And that's the second challenge. So the second challenge is what we call diplomatic communication and representation. How can we effectively communicate? And how can we effectively represent the people we are representing? And that's one of the challenges that diplomats face around the world. And that's one of the challenges also that uh, our ambassadors face, even in our chat room. How are they representing the future diplomats? How are they communicating? And that's what the writer was, will tell you in chapter two of the textbook when you continue to read. The second challenge is to conduct yourself through your communication and your representation. The first challenge is to make sure security-wise you are protected. Be mindful. And the second challenge will be as ambassadors, how can we communicate effectively and how can we represent ourselves? But not just ourselves, but represent the group of people we we are facing. Today, the problem of representation is more complex. The problem for representation of diplomats is more complex. Why? Because there are a lot of people claiming to be carrying messages between groups. There are a lot of people claiming to be carrying messages and they, be, they, they, are, they are claiming to become ambassadors when they are not. So the true representation is important. So as a diplomat, as an ambassador, we need people who will represent us and represent us in an ethical manner, in a truthful way. The third challenge to you as ambassador or diplomat would be diplomatic understanding and avoiding misunderstanding. It's very important. The, the third challenge is presented by achieving diplomatic understanding and avoiding misunderstanding. To be an effective and efficient or tactful diplomat, you need to understand people, culture, and language. Again, for you to be an effective diplomat, you need to understand people, their culture, and their language. And that's a challenge for us as ambassadors and diplomats. We do not want to learn other people's culture. We do not want to learn the language. We do not care about how they think and how they feel. We do not care about their communication. And so we are, we are not avoiding misunderstanding. And once you cannot avoid misunderstanding, you miss the mark of becoming tactful and efficient. Again, I will continue to use the word tactful because it is important to become a tactful ambassador. Again, I gave you an assignment to search for the word, develop a paper on, on, on tactful 
and and and, and how it relates to your to your relationship and to your role as an ambassador. But we need to avoid misunderstanding because misunderstanding causes confusion. And as a diplomat, if you cannot understand people, you cannot understand the culture, you're not a people's person who understands culture, you miss the mark. That's why right from the United States perspective and understanding on diplomacy and the understanding of sending people around the world as ambassador, every ambassador must understand the culture that they are going to, to, to be working with. They must understand the people and they must understand the language. It is important because understanding can avoid misunderstanding and misunderstanding is a pitfall to any diplomatic official or ambassador being effective. So do not to understand this that become an effective ambassador, you must understand that. So what we're talking about that the idea of the idea of what we call common language. Common language is important to avoid misunderstanding. Right? Common language is the idea. Common language is present. It's important to do that. No, hear me, hear me, ambassadors. Understanding the common language or another person's language is an important skill for those of you who are going to be handling communications between groups and between people to be successful. I'm going to say this again. Understanding the common language of another person is important. It is an important diplomatic skill. For those of you who are going to be handling communications, you're going to be advocating, you're going to be negotiating between groups, between individuals. If you don't understand and you don't have a common understanding of the people's language, you can never be effective, my friend. It's, an, it's a vital skill. So professional diplomats often see skill as an important uh, 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 attribute to the perfection, important attribute to the perfection. Any question, I will soon be closing so that you can have your question. Uh, I will soon be closing. Let me talk about the, the fifth challenge. The fifth challenge that we have today in diplomacy, why we need diplomacy and diplomacy, why we need diplomacy and diplomacy because of the challenges. The fifth challenge, is the demand on diplomatic persuasion and negotiation. Take the note. The fourth challenge, the reason why we need diplomats and diplomacy is the challenge that we have on diplomat diplomatic persuas persuasion and negotiation. Persuasion is P-E-R-S-U-A-S-I-O-N. And negotiation is N-E-G-O-T-I-A-T-I-O-N. Negotiation, persuasion, and negotiation. Right, uh, persuasion and negotiation is important. You must be able to persuade someone <laughs> to buy into your beliefs. You must be able to persuade them to understand your principles and your values. Right? For instance, let me go back to the market woman who's selling her goose. The, the woman is trying to persuade you to get her goose. You try to negotiate with a woman to tell her ten dollars is too high. I can pay eight fifty. You're trying to persuade her, and she's trying to persuade you. So both of you are trying to persuade each other the value of what you have, and you try to negotiate. Now you have the skills. How many of you know that you have the skills to go and buy a pair of shoes or hundred and twenty U.S. dollars in a store here in California? One pair of shoes, hundred and twenty U.S. dollars. You still have the gift and the persuasion to persuade the person who's selling that shoes to you for hundred and twenty U.S. dollars. You can persuade them, and you can be able to negotiate and convince them that you can buy the shoes for hundred dollars or even eighty dollars, saving you at least twenty or forty dollars. It's your persuasive ability and the skills of negotiation. Then you become a diplomat negotiating, and that's one of the problems we have. People do not know how to be persuasive and negotiate. If you have problem 
if you don't know how to persuade other people, you don't know how to negotiate with other people, you miss the mark of becoming tactful and efficient. So those are the problems that we face. You got people who want to be diplomats, but at the same time, they cannot persuade someone to follow the dream. They cannot persuade someone to, to stop what they are doing. They cannot end up what they are doing. They cannot negotiate. Where persuasion does not result in agreement, where, again, listen to this, where persuas persuasion does not agree in agreement, it can, it can also extend in what we call negotiation. You're trying to persuade the person and the person cannot agree. At the same time, it can extend in negotiation. You can negotiate, you can negotiate with the person. And negotiating with the person is simply, that's a process by which, it, by which you can tell the person to say, if you, can give, if you can give me what I want, or you can give us what we want, we will give you what you want. That's negotiation. You know, it's not always on your side. If you give me this, I will give you that. So the woman tells you, if you give me uh, uh, $50, I will give you this war clock. And, you know, she's trying to, then you try to negotiate, I can give you 20. So it's, it is important. You know, even in your group, be persuasive. Be persuasive. Be everything. Be able to, to, to communicate. And let me talk about the last challenge as we come to close. The last challenge, and I will take your I will take your, your question. The last challenge, why we need diplomacy and diplomacy today, the last challenge is for those who conduct for, for those to those who conduct relationships between groups. Uh, it's what we call diplomatic culture. I told you about diplomatic culture. I'll tell you about diplomatic culture. Now, you need to understand, as a diplomat, you're going to be working in culture. We're going to go back again, simple to the woman in the market. I am the buyer. I'm going to buy this fish. The woman, I'm in my own culture. I am the buyer. She's in her culture. She's the seller. And I'm going into the market or I'm going into her store. That's another culture, another cultural environment. So a, an ambassador or a diplomat may find himself in at least three cultural places. First, your own culture. Second, the person's culture you're trying to negotiate with. And third, out of the environment or the bystander culture. In the market, there are a lot of people listening. There are a lot of people passing by. There are a lot of people selling. Right? Well, another woman can with, with shot from the other side. I got market here, my fish is here. If horse is expensive, mine is here. You are in a cultural environment. The same way real diplomats are the embassy representing us, you're gonna be in a cultural environment. So, first of all, if you are an ambassador from the United States of America, and I'm serving in in, in Nairobi, Kenya, I need to understand I'm, a, I'm, I'm an American with an American culture, but I'm going to serve in Kenya and I must be able to adapt or understand the Kenyan's culture. Why? Because I'm in a different culture. And some ambassadors and and, and diplomats are unable to be adjusted in the cultural environment. And if you cannot get in, adjusted in the cultural environment, you cannot succeed, you cannot be tactful, you cannot be efficient. So your culture as an ambassador is important, but the culture of the next person is important. So I'm an ambassador from South Africa, into Nigeria, I have a cultural experience. What's my cultural experience? I'm in Nigeria. My cultural history is from South Africa. But then I'm also interacting with all the embassies and ambassadors in Nigeria as well. I'm also relating with all the cultural people. So understanding culture is important. And I want to Excuse me. That one of the things that causing problem to 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 our effectiveness and efficiency. 
ambassadors need to understand culture. Hear me, when you come to our chat room, we have culture on our chat room. Culture can also be part of the rules and regulations, the things that govern the other country, the things that govern the other country. That's why, listen to this, that's why when you are sent from your country, your country become the sunny agent or the sunny state. The country you go to, it becomes the receiving agent or the receiving state. Now, when you do something and do not follow the culture of that country, or you broke the law, or you melt, you melt it into the business that says the ambassador is happy referred to as non. Uh, don't be ahead of this notes. Yeah. Has been has been has been referred to as non. Grandpa simply means you have to leave the country because you have broken the rules, the regulations, or the cultural differences. So it is important. A receiving, a receiving country can receive you, but if you melt into something that is not right, it can ask you to leave that country. And on an international law, you have to leave that country. On an international law, you have to leave. The, you cannot say, no, I'm an ambassador here. And I have to stay here but to serve. No, if the receiving country have realized that you have done something contrary to the rules, the regulations, you met in the government. Uh, or you do that. And in fact, in 2015, the United States of America post a sanction on Russia because they believe that Russia melted in the elections. So there was a there was a financial embargo placed on Russia. And they asked most of the most of the uh, most of the Russians ambassadors and diplomats to leave America. And when the Russians got the hit of the embargo financial embargo and got a hit of their diplomats leaving from the United States of America, Russia also placed a sanction on America's ambassador to leave the country and they had to leave. So Russia expelled about 777, they had 777, they expelled 777 ambassadors from Russia leaving leaving them with, I think, 222 ambassadors left in the country. So these are, these are the six important reasons why we need to understand that uh, ambassadors are important and we must do, and we must do just that. I will fix some questions, and then when we come back on Tuesday, I will review what we just said because I know we have a lot of things that we talk about today. Uh, 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 okay, so, so somebody asked here, how do we become diplomats in this space and of what importance is our diplomacy since diplomats are appointed by head of government. Now, it's very, very, very important. We are not recruiting diplomats for government. So if you want to become a, a diplomat of your government, you have to seek a job with your government. We are recruiting diplomats and ambassadors for future diplomats cooperation. There's a difference in becoming a diplomat with your government. So we are not, don't get me, don't, don't mess up this class to think that you're coming to learn to become a diplomat because you're gonna be a diplomat of your government or United Nations, no. You are becoming a diplomat in your own right because you're also a diplomat, but you're becoming an ambassador, our representation future diplomats so it's enough it's not for your government so don't get this whole training twisted thinking that you're coming now to become a diplomat and you can you go and say you're representing your government those are you who are attending this training those are you who are going to be 
opportunity to get an ID card, you're going to see it's going to say future diplomats ambassador, not, not, not ambassador of Ghana government or not the ambassador of the American government. So don't get it wrong. Right? Don't get it wrong. Let's be mindful of that. You are not a diplomat of your government. Right? If you're looking for a job for, with your government now, you're at the wrong place. If you're looking for a job with the United Nations, you're at the wrong place. We are training diplomats for the future diplomats cooperation, not for your government. All right. Uh, let me get to the next question. Can diplomats engage in other private business or businesses while on a diplomatic mission? All right. So if you go into, if you are in, in Ghana and you want to go to India on a diplomatic mission, on your business affairs, yes, you're going to conduct a business. But if at if an entity sent you, for instance, a future diplomat sent you to go to South Africa, but you're a businessman and you think you can go on mission for the, for the future diplomats and leave our mission and start setting your business, no, you're going to be brought back home. You can never do your personal business on a diplomatic mission. Yes, you can go on a diplomatic mission on your business's account and you can conduct your business. But you can never do a diplomatic mission on, on another person's account. Again, if you are representing a government, not a future, if you are, if you are ambassador with the Ghanaian government and to send you here to the US, you cannot come and start selling your Ghana, your, your, your Ghana must go bag or your Ghana must go shoes or clothes. You are on a diplomatic mission. You are here to protect the interest of your government and the interest of your people. You are here to protect your citizens and make sure the citizens in the US is getting the services that they need either from the U.S. government or from the Ghanaian government. So you cannot come here and start selling Ghanaian clothes and Ghanaian shoes and Ghanaian handbag as a diplomat. You have lost your integrity. You have lost of becoming a diplomat or becoming a business selling agent. <laughs> so no, no. You cannot be sent on a diplomatic mission and start selling clothes. You cannot, you cannot do that, right? Let me take another question. Uh, did I just answer this question? Yeah. What are the prerequisites that qualify someone to become appointed as a Duma to represent a country? Now, we, we don't want to jump ahead of that. That will be our next week. Our next week class, we're going to be talking about the, 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 the prerequisite. But I will just tell you in the nutshell, in the nutshell, in many countries, you will have a bachelor's degree. Uh, I'm talking about generally, and that's for the future diploma. In many countries, you must have at least a bachelor's degree uh, in politics or international relations. Uh, international relations, a bachelor's degree to be appointed by, uh, uh, by some countries. Now, it, it varies based upon countries, so you need to ask your foreign services, you know, department, uh, what the requirements are to become an ambassador uh, uh, with this country. But from the U.S., you must uh, have at least a bachelor's degree in international relations or in, or in politics. Uh, it's not a particular degree, but you at least have a bachelor's degree somewhere in, in those areas. A master's degree put you at a, at a higher level and a higher edge. You must be ethical because they're going to do a background check requirement. You must be ethical. You must be responsible. Uh, you, must, you must live up to the tax of becoming an ambassador. So every country has their own requirements to so go by by the requirement. But for the future diplomats to become an ambassador with us, you must go through this training uh, for six to eight weeks, between six to eight weeks. You must, I think this one will last for six to seven weeks because of the, of the final test. You must be able to take the final test and pass the final test to become an ambassador with us. It 
an adika carry ambassador with us you must be able to pass your test submit all your assignments and pass your test and you must also live at the at at, at an ethical standard because uh after 12 months you may, you 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 may have to go through a, a brush up training so your so your ad card can be renewed right so there are requirements for us uh at least bachelor's degree in policy of international relations as a tumor for countries ethical responsibility and live up to the expectation that's correct that's correct that's correct thank you for for tapping that ask at least a bachelor's degree in politics or international relations. That's what I said. And that's uh uh and that's what I said. You should be ethical, be responsible, and live up to the expectation. Oh God, thank you so much. Uh all right, I need to close or two hours. Uh if we we'll go for two hours, tell me it's two hours now, two hours. So I, that I tell me I get taking questions for two hours and eight minutes. So we're gonna close pretty soon. We're gonna save you some time today. Uh Another person asks, can you function as a self-appointed diploma? Well, who's going to recognize you as an appointed diploma? What, what, what is an appointed diploma? No diploma appoint himself. <laughs> like I, I just told you that the that diplomas of your country should be appointed by your president. So if you represent your country, you need to be appointed by your president or whoever, whoever appoints diploma in your country. So if you Appoint yourself. What about credentials will you give yourself? Will you, will you, will you put on your credentials self-made diploma? Oh, yes. There are a lot of self-made diplomas around the world. People who just call themselves ambassador and diplomas, and they are not. They are self-appointed. <laughs> you know, you can never appoint yourself as a diploma. You cannot. You cannot. You need to you need to identify with a body. You need to you need to be ethical and responsible. If you appoint yourself as a diplomat, how will you be ethical? Who hold you accountable? Who are you uh, submissive to? Who are you representing? Now, simply diplomats or an ambassador is a representation. Can you represent yourself? Yes, just because you are him or me, but not in a diplomatic manner. So never appoint yourself as a diplomat. Someone say amen. That's why I said amen before, because someone tapped amen, and someone just said amen again. Ambassador Priest, you must, Ambassador Princess, he must be a woman of God or something. <laughs> you keep telling me say amen. That's why I always say amen too. I want to be my first saying amen here. But uh, you cannot. You cannot self-appoint yourself, friend, no. That's why the future diplomats is here. We have created this avenue. We can appoint you as ambassadors. And that's what this training is all about. So to give you the nuts and bolts and responsibilities of becoming an effective diplomat. And we can appoint you as a diplomat, but you cannot appoint yourself as a diplomat. You cannot, right? So make use of the future diplomats or you know, opportunity, make use of our credentials and make use of our platform. We can appoint you, we can give you all the tools you need to be tactful, effective, and efficient, but you cannot appoint yourself, right? That's why I, with the authority invested in me by our bylaws and our policy and recognition by the American government, I can appoint you. I can appoint you based upon our authority given to us, based upon the authority given to me, you know, as an institution incorporated, registered, approved in the United States of America to do diplomatic business around the world. I can appoint you. That's why most of my, the ID cards, you have to see my signature. Most of our, uh, our, our uh, uh, ambassadorial credentials, you know, the president or the DG, Ernest Gibson, his name or his signature has to be somewhere because I have the authority to appoint you. All right. Um, someone said, can diplomats engage in all of no, I, I just read that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, the last question I have right now, are we going to have diplomatic passports? Hey, come on, come on, come on, come on. The future diplomats does not give passports. We're not a government. If I gave you a future diplomat passport, yes, it's a passport. But you're not going to use it to travel, you know, to get into another country. 
Nobody going to put visa in your passport. You use the Equus passport if you're in Africa. I travel with the American the US passport. I must, I must show the passport and I'm, I need visa. I travel with my country's passport. I don't have to give myself a future diploma passport. So, so what would that do for you, my friend? A future diploma passport? Oh, come on. I can give you one. Very simple, they gave you one. But the country put that the, 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 the visa into it? I don't know. Would it be useful to travel from uh, Nigeria to the US? Nope. They will want to see your, your West African passport, the Nigerian government passport or the ECWAS passport. So we can we can give you one. It's not going to be useful to you, my friend. I don't need a passport from a diplomat to do diplomatic relationship around the world. Okay? So no, we're not going to give you diplomatic passport. Use your passport from your country. Right? Use your, use your passport from where we give, we're going to give you a diplomatic, uh, what we call letter of credence. It comes like a passport, it's in a cage, it's in the form, but we don't call it a passport. Letter of credence, right? You present it with your, with your country passport, it tells you you represent us around the world. They don't, they're not gonna put visa on your letter of credence. They're not gonna say you are representing us. All right, any more question? I can take your question, I can take your concern, but I wanna say thank you for listening to us today. It was a great time spent with you again, as always. You are fabulous and you are you are a wonderful uh, set of people. Uh, I will leave you with with couple of a couple of assignment uh, to add up with the assignment that you already have. Uh, but the first assignment that you need to add, please take note of this one. Uh, you're gonna answer a question. Why more people say that you are an ambassador when you are traveling abroad? Why people will tell you that you are an ambassador when you are traveling abroad? Tell us in a couple of paragraphs about one to 200, in one to 200 words. Why? No, sorry, in 200 words, I want to say two to 300, but I want to say two. In 200 words, tell us why people will say that you are an ambassador when you are traveling abroad. So that's your assignment for this week. Please do it. I'm talking about the assignment. Understand that. Remember that we have discussed the private actors in Dubai and we say big girls and the wealth uh, Mandela girls, they are in people to people Dubai Humanitarian organizations, if you have an organization in your country and you are engaging in, 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 in meeting people's needs, you are you are serving in what they call people to people Dubai Remember we said that, a, that the United States uh, secret seven, uh, secret seven have more than twelve thousand, more than twelve thousand, uh, 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 or people serving around the world. Uh, we said, uh, secret, se uh, secret seven specialists. They are, they can also be in, not just, they can not just be involved in security purpose and security, but they are also involved in providing health services and you know English, English, English lang language programs in different countries. They are doing construction. They are in engineering. I said, uh, by international law, if a diplomat or an ambassador has for, has has been declared uh, personal non grata, remember this word, personal non grata. That means that the person must leave that country, and they may leave immediately or based upon the time they leave. It's called personal non grata. It's P-E-R-S-O-N-A. The next word is non, N-O-N. And the last word is grata, G-R-A-T-A. 
personal non grata simply means that you have been formally declared to leave that country. And by international law, you cannot say, well, I will send you up to my country. I need to stay. You need to leave. Right? Uh, remember we said that according to uh, N.S. Satwa, that uh, uh, his definition involved two key words. We say intelligence and tight. Intelligence and tight. We say in the United States of America, ambassadors are appointed by the president. Not Congress, not the Speaker of the House, not the Senate, but by the president. We also said in our, in our presentation that the United States having 265 diplomatic missions around the world. 265 diplomatic missions around the world. Uh, we also said that the act of one nation or state accepting the independence or legacy of another nation is called diplomatic recognition. Remember that. I review everything we did today in less than five in less in less than five minutes. The act of one nation or state accepting the independence or legacy of another nation, we say it is new as diplomatic recognition. Right? I did say last. I did say. I did. I did explain to it on Monday. If you never got this one, let me give it to you again. That the president and prime ministers also engage in diplomatic activities. And their diplomatic activities is new as summit, S-U-M-M-I-T. So presidents are not get, presidents are not called diplomats. Presidents cannot be, uh, 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 prime ministers can be, not be referred to rather as ambassadors, but they also engage in diplomatic activities. And their diplomatic activities can be referred to as the top 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 or summit why because they are because they are meeting people because they are meeting people at the top they are meeting other presidents they are not they are not meeting people at the bottom they are meeting other presidents they are meeting prime ministers so the the diplomatic operation is new as the top or is called summit why summit because they meet with people at the summit when they're having the summit or the conferences at the United Nations headquarters. So remember that presidents also engage in, of, in diplomatic activities and those diplomatic activities are called summit because they are at the top. Um, uh, why, am I, why am I leaving here? We said that an American humorist define Diplomacy as the art of being able to say uh, "ducky" until you have a rock in your hand, and we say you must define the word "dodgy" d o g g i e and what it means. Remember that. We also said the largest U.S. diplomatic mission is in the country of Mexico. We also said that people who People do not have to have what we call great international relationships to be to, to recognize the importance of accepting uh, and behaving diplomatically. You don't have to have international relations experience a great deal to act diplomatically. You don't have to. That's why we engage in our platform at di diplomatically when you come. Right? I gave you the five major branches of the of the services in the United States. We talk about the council of affairs, uh, the helping people. We talk about uh, about the economic affairs. We talk about management affairs. Remember that. Uh, we said, according to the textbook, when people interact and communicate internationally. They are doing what they call diplomat. They are in what in an exchange that we call diplomatic relations. Understand diplomatic relations. We also said that the definition of diplomatic is an act of saying good things, but the rector said it was bad. Why? Because it shows some good things, politeness, but it also deceptive 
and it provides the potential to, of violence. Remember that? Remember those things I'm telling you. Uh, we said social and cultural activities such as sports events, films, books, uh, radio broadcasting, all can be subscribed to what we call public diplomacy. Right? We say that, uh, uh, well, I'm going to stop here. I cannot give you, I'm going to stop. I'm going to continue. Uh, uh, I'm going to continue the review show when we meet next week. Uh, so God bless you. Thank you so much. I know some, some of you are writing these points down already. Yes. So can I have today's question again? Uh, which question was that? Is that the assignment? The assignment is, if that's the assignment for the day, I said, why, why more people say to you that you are an ambassador when you are traveling abroad? Why people say, oh, well, okay, I'm traveling abroad. Why, why people say I'm an ambassador? What has, what has to be involved? Or what are some of the things that have to be involved for people to say you are ambassador? I said in those days when you're traveling abroad, you have to be you know, an ambassador representing a country or you, know, you are sent by your president. But why nowadays that when you are traveling abroad, abroad the person say they are on a diplomatic mission? Okay, they are, they are an ambassador. What it means by that? Uh, more power to you. Okay, Ambassador Judas, that's great. I appreciate this. This is for Ambassador Ama Mercy Samuel. And Ambassador Judas said, more power to, to your elbow. I know because you tell me more power to your elbow. Ambassador Mercy Samuel, the person want to say, we appreciate you. Yes, we appreciate you too, Ambassador Mercy Samuel. I appreciate you. Thank you, sir, for this lecture and explanation. I, I, thank, I thank you too for participating. Uh, nice presentation, DG School of Diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you as well. I just gave him some of the comments that we have right now. Uh, okay, I cannot give you all the comments, but thank you ever so much. Uh, I would say, uh, please submit your assignments. You have all the assignments, the one I gave you last week and the one I gave you today. They all have to be submitted to us by Sunday night, by 11.55, your time and my time, 11.55 p.m. Not, not 12 o'clock a.m. Monday morning, no, 11.55. Again, I have started grading your assignments. I'm going to, the ones that were submitted, I'm going to send back to you. Please, let me say this to you. Some of you tap your assignments, like when you open the email, and like you're sending me an email, you tap your assignment. It's unacceptable. It's not going to be graded. It's never accepted. You're not going to get a feedback from us. Follow the instructions. We said, tap your assignment in the World Perfect document. Put your name. That should be a cover page a cover page on your assignment, put your name, put your course title, put your, your email and your address, that gonna, I mean your email or telephone, that, your email that we can contact you with, and put the date of submission. The date you are submitting your assignment. Here, yeah, folks, this is a college. It's an institution. Don't submit assignment to your teacher. You send an email. Please know this is my assignment and you start typing something as an email to us. It's never accepted. So we, we your, your assignments have been some of your some of your assignments have been rejected and we send it back to you. I'm not going to send it back to you. You have failed your assignment. You have to you have to redo your assignment and send it. Tap a double space in the World Perfect document. We want to know that you are an ambassador and you know how to create a document. That part of your assignment. If you're making a report as an ambassador, will you just tap an email 
in an email and send it to your and send it as a report. No, you have to tap it in a word perfect document. It has to be too. And watch your English grammar. Watch your spelling. I did my. I went through most of it. You just, you know, common things that you you are misspelling, and so you are losing points on those assignments. We're going to mark it. We're going to put a comment. We're going to send it back to you. You lose your point on misspelling. You you. you or uh, there's something that I don't know where you understand it. want to say, run off sentences. You know, some people just write off the sentence and and they make three or four paragraphs and try to make it in one sentence or maybe two paragraphs in one sentence. No comma, no period, no exclamatory mark if there's needed. Uh, you're losing point on those type of assignments. All right, be constructive in your assignment. Watch your English language. Watch your spelling again. Uh, plaque raising, we 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 discover that some of you are taking people saying from the internet or from the book and just presenting it to us. We're all giving the author credit, right? And at the at a, at a scalar level, it's called stealing. On a local level, plaque raising, it's called plaque raising on a scalar level, but on a local level, it's called stealing. That's the definition of plagiarism. It simply means you are taking people's information and you are giving yourself the credit for that. So every time you are trying to quote somebody, put it in quotation mark, or you don't have to put it in quotation mark. You can put at the end of the person's quotation, you can put a parenthesis, the person's name. And you can say maybe Ernest Gibson, for instance, Ernest Gibson, 2017. Or 2018, it was when I made that statement. At the at the end of your paper, you don't have a reference. So at the reference, you will put the scene where Ernest you, you see the scene where you put Ernest Gibson and you put 2018 at your reference. You put then you have to put the article, the name of the article, or the website for which you took the assignment. Well, if most of you have not done this uh, after your high school level. Then you're gonna do that with us. It's required. It's a standard way of education and presenting assignment. Uh, I know some of you have asked for the format. I'm gonna give you format if you want that, but not for a definition. I'm talking about writing between two to three hundred sentences. But someone asked me, can I give you an example, a format in presenting your definitions? No, come on. I can give you an example of you know of a format of do your presentation of your of your definition. I cannot do that, but I can give you a format of a full flesh document. It will not be yours, but it will be a, a document from me. How to get your cover page? How to get your? I can send that to Ambassador Summer, Ambassador David, and they can distribute that to you if you need that. But how you need to present your cover page? How we need the cover page of your assignment to be? If you're writing between one to, if you're writing between two to three hundred pages. And the content, the content. Let, let there be a flow in your content. Finish one, one paragraph and let it flow into the next, next paragraph. Don't have your professor reading something and then you change it and drop into something else. And no, let there be a flow in your writing, in your presentation, right? That's scholarly writing, my friend. You are an ambassador to be. You are a scholar. <laughs> okay, great. So do not take this institution or school for joke. You can just send any any assignment you think will be accepted. No, your assignment worth fifty percent of your grades, and if you're not doing well your assignment, like I told you, you're gonna repeat this class, right? You're not just gonna repeat the assignment if you fail the course. You're gonna repeat the entire course for another six weeks, especially your assignment. Okay, uh. Assignment should be done on a word perfect document here yeah, with double space with your name, course title, email address, date of submission. Check your spelling, wash your punctuations, mark. That's true. That's it. What was the last assignment in the first lecture? No, please, please. Your, your, your classmates have been tapping the assignment. Please connect with one of your classmates and ask them, I cannot go back, you know, 
uh, on that. I have said it over and over and again, the assignment. And also, is the assignment is also posted in the chat room, folks. Make use of the chat room. Your assignment is posted in your chat room. Your, your questions now make me go two minutes over my time. It's, it's two, two hours and 32 minutes. I have two hours for you, so I'm going to stop here. Your, your questions are very much important. Yes, the assignment should have a cover page. Yeah. Yes. Give credit to the writer. That's correct. Don't that's right. And, and, as, and copy it from the internet or the book and send it to me. No, give credit to the writer. And the last page should be your reference page. Reference page simply means the place you took that reference from. Because we've got to make research. We've got to make sure that what you are seeing about that writer is true, is accurate. So one of the things that you need to do is if you read a nice paragraph and sentence, I always want people not to copy the same paragraph and sentence and put it in their assignment and give me a reference. It's unacceptable most of the time. I want you to paraphrase. I want you to think about what the writer has said. Think about it and rewrite that sentence or the, or the paragraph in your own words. It just means that you understand the material, you have that, you have, excuse me, you have digested the material and you can present the material back to your professor or you can present the material to the world. Don't just copy and paste, folks. Read that, those paragraphs, digest those paragraphs and rewrite them in your own words. It shows me and your professor that you have understood the material the study book you have understood the question and you can present it back so do not copy and paste rewrite in your own word your own vocabulary rewrite sentences and let the sentence, sentences be constructive now i may have to i may have to have a special section on assignments and presentation throughout the week if you need that and I can help you to do that. But it will help you to be a composer, folks. And even after that, you can be able to write your own book. I have, I have written 20, 22 course books and, you know, materials. You know, uh, or I can help you give you the skills that are needed. And those materials are course books that, you know, people are using, Bible colleges are using around the world. You know, I can give you those, I can give you those, those hand up, you know, and those preparation. But become a writer become a producer write a material that will represent you that you can publish don't copy and post i mean copy and paste right paraphrase it write your own sentences write your own words i thank you ever so much remember i'll be talking to you on tuesday now on monday tuesday class begin come on time i'm going to work on the on the situation that we had today i apologize again for technical difficulties, I'm going to work ahead of time so we can start. I would say come 10 minutes before class time, and then we're going to get you off class, right? Send your assignment to us on Sunday so the assignments can be done. Thank you so much. I will talk to you on on on, on uh, Tuesday, and I will be looking forward to your, your assignment on Saturday night. Have a good week and a good weekend. Good night to most of you. Good afternoon and good evening. Again, I'm Ernest Gibson. I am the uh, founder and the director general of the Future Diplomats and I'm glad that you are part of our training section. Share the link. Don't forget, please like this video after today. Share the link. Share the link. And everyone of you who like our videos, I can know who liked the video because, uh, because we have the report every country everybody including the age group of people who are watching our video some of you have just watched the video for only 30 minutes you're not watching the video at the end it tells me who watched the video from start to finish you to tell me you used to tell me some people just get it for three minutes and they hang they get off and some of you have watched the videos but you're not liking every time you click on the video to watch please like and please share we need 1000 people by the end of this week we got 500 and I think 551 or 52 people right now. We need what we need a balance 500 by the end of this week. So right now, as I talk to you, please go, please like, 
please share. Please share. Please like. Please subscribe. Tell your friend to subscribe. Tell your neighbors to subscribe. Tell everybody to subscribe. Remember, this training is free for you, but we'll also ask for donation. If you can donate for this training, because we're still having more than 1,000 people waiting to get this training after you. So please have this training to be effective. Give us your give us your give us your contribution uh, uh, so that we can make our training a success. Thank you again. Like, subscribe, share. Like, subscribe, share, and donate. Ask us, we're going to send you the link. If you want to donate, you can donate five dollars, ten dollars, hundred dollars, whatever it may be. It will remember we gave you all the books free of charge. That book alone and all the course material could cost you about seventy-five dollars. These two hours training will cost you thousands of dollars if you are paying us to do this for you. Right? Remember, please learn to share, learn to give, learn to support the work of the future diplomat. It's because of you we are here. We are depending on your support. We are depending on that. We're not trying to just get from you, but we are giving and keep giving. We want you now to start sharing with us so that we can keep our doors open. We are on 48 nations around the world. We're all asking one, anybody, we're all asking anybody for any money we are giving everything free. It's time now for you to start just donating. We are not charging, just donate. Thank you so much. God bless you. I will talk to you again. Again, share, love, donate. Share, love, subscribe, donate. Share, love, subscribe, donate. Bye-bye. God bless you. I will talk to you again.